Hey guys, uh, we're going to go over quickly your Module 7 um, statistic, uh, statistical reasoning in everyday life. So how do psychologists um, get their information? All right, let's go ahead and knock this out. Uh, statistical reasoning, um, it is a statistical, statistical procedure. Um, when statistical procedures analyze and interpret data and let you see um, what the unaided eye misses. Uh, and so what it's able to do is kind of take uh, the data or take uh, measures that we use and take statistics so that we can see uh, what's actually going on and then we can actually um, do things with the data. Um, and so describing data, um, you have meaningful description of the data is important in research uh, because if misinterpretations are going to lead to incorrect conclusions. Um, so misrepresented data or misrepresented results are going to lead um, to your conclusions of your study uh, being incorrect or leading uh, research in a wrong direction. All right, so now we're going to talk about like what uh, statistics uh, that psychologists use. Um, so we have the measures of central tendencies, which you should remember from your math class, um, any math classes. And so you have the mean, uh, which is the... Uh, arithmetic average of scores in a distribution obtained by adding the scores and then dividing them by the number. So the average. Then you have the median, which is the middle score in, the, in a ranked order distribution. And you may want to make a note that that one is the most important and it is the one that's kind of left unaffected as we move through statistics. And then the mode, which is the most frequently occurring score in the distribution. And so we may refer to these as the three M's for the measures of central tendency. All right, so with uh, central tendencies, you also have the measures of variation. So the different, the changes or the way the scores vary. And so one of those is the range. Um, range is the difference between the highest and lowest scores in the distribution. And then standard deviation is going to be the average difference between each score and the mean. Um, and so if you have a large standard deviation, um, which is in blue, right, it's going to be more spread out, right? So that means the variation between the scores is more spread out. There's more space between them. Um, and then with a small standard deviation, just scores are going to be more bunched together um, and closely related. All right, so standard deviation, how often um, often you are going to be asked are not going to be asked to calculate standard deviation. Um, so we're not going to worry about how to calculate it. Um, but what you you will need to know how to apply the concept. So for example, uh, which of the following sets of data have the greatest standard deviation? So how do you figure out which one has the greatest uh, variance between the numbers or between the figures? And so how you figure that out is down here. You look at, you can estimate standard deviation by looking at the spread uh, of the numbers. And so if you look here at your data points, you have um, from 1, the range is from 1 to 30. That's a pretty, you know, widespread there. And then you have a range from 5 to 18, and then a range of 30 to 35. And so you may say that you know, the first set of data points has the greatest standard deviation um, of the three sets of points because of the spread between the numbers. You can also find um, the mean and then compare the mean to each number in the, in the group, and that can also tell you, but the first one may be a little bit easier for you to manage. All right, so also a standard deviation, you have a normal distribution. And so it's a normal distribution is just a distribution of scores um, that produces a bell-shaped uh, symmetrical curve, also known as the normal curve. Um, and the mean, median, and mode fall exactly in the same point on the normal distribution, and that's going to go right down the center there, right on the 100 on the x-axis. Um, so the span of one standard deviation, when you look at this, to either side of the mean is approximately 68.2%, uh, right? So that is obviously on one side of the mean, one standard deviation is going to be from the center line over to the next line to the right or from the center line over to the next line on the left, 
right? And you can see that in each of those categories, it's 34.1%. You add those together and you get 68.2%. Um, and this is on for IQ is what we're looking at here. And so the average IQ is 100. Um, most people and are going to fall between 85 and 115, which is one standard deviation away from the mean. Um, the IQ extremes are going to be above 130 and below 70. So on the outside, you can see um, two standard deviations, above two standard deviations away from the mean. You have 2.1% of people and then 0.1%. Um, so 2.2% of the population on either side of the mean are going to fall below um, below the mean or below 70 uh, 70 and the others are going to fall below 2.1 all right so we look at the normal curve and this is the standard deviations i was talking about before one standard deviation away from the mean is going to be 68.27 percent of the people being uh, tested are going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean um, 95.45% of the population is going to fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And then you have 99.73 are going to fall within three standard deviations from the mean. And then obviously the rest of the population will fall four standard deviations away from the mean. All right, the other thing that's going to be important for you to understand is that, and I'm going to draw a little line here straight down the middle right right there um, you are this is going to be 50 percent of the population on this side and 50 percent of the population on the higher end above 150 percent below all right so you will need to know these different figures these different numbers in terms of standard deviations from the mean and then also that 50 percent fall on a normal curve 50 percent fall on the left and 50 percent fall on the right okay all right, so also in measures of central tendencies, you have skewed distributions. And you can see here um, to the left, right, or if you look down here, you have the mean, which is going to be 70, right? So that's the average of all the scores that have been added up here. And then you have your mode, which is the one that's, you know, recorded the most or happens the most. And then the median is the middle score. Right, and so this one is the most reliable in terms of our three M's. And the mean is the one that's going to be most affected by outliers. And so uh, because we do have the one score of 710 um, and we have this score of 475 and then 90, right, you have three scores that are actually above the mean. And you have all these scores that actually fall below the mean. But because you have these outliers are so high, it's going to move the mean further away uh, from the median and the mode. So you have a skewed distribution. And so we'll take a look at what that looks like here. All right, so you have a positive and negative skew. Uh, and so the skew is actually at the lower point. And so like I showed you on the last one, on the last slide, right, you have this one score way out here. All right, and so that is actually being shown on a in a graph here where it's the smallest one you have fewer people scoring in that area more people scoring in the higher area all right so in a negative skew majority of scores above the mean are above the mean and one or a few uh, extremely low scores cause the mean to be less than the median score all right so that's opposite of the graph that i showed you before the graph i showed you before was a positive skew where majority of the scores are below the mean um, and one or a few extremely high scores are going to cause the mean to be greater um, than the actual median score. All right, so inferen with inferential statistics, um, basically what uh, the importance of inferential statistics is that they allow us to make inferences about what these numbers mean. And so it involves estimating what is happening in a sample population for the purpose of making decisions about a pop, about that population's characteristics based and it's and it's based in probability theory right so that these numbers tell us or allow us to make inferences about what's going on uh, with this group based on the data so basically inference statistics allow us to say 
if it worked for this population, we can then estimate uh, that it will work for the rest of the population. So for example, drug testing, if meds worked for, the, for one sample, we estimate that they will have the same effect for the rest of the population. So we take that uh, sample and then we're able to extrapolate or um, generalize those findings to others. Uh, there's always a chance for error in whatever findings, uh, whatever the findings may be. So the hypothesis and the results must be tested for null. And we're going to talk about what that is here in a second. So the null hypothesis uh, states that there is no difference between the two sets of data. So the null is basically the opposite of your hypothesis. So what's the purpose of it, of the null hypothesis? Um, it's until the research shows um, that there's a difference, the researcher has to assume that any difference that's present is because of chance, or it happened um, because of chance and not by anything that the experimenter has manipulated. Right, so it assumes you're you're wrong until you prove that you're right. All right, so when we look at the null hypothesis, you have a couple things. You have if the null is true, right, the opposite of your hypothesis is true, and then the null being false, that is the opposite of your hypothesis not true. Um, and then uh, what you have decision make uh, the decision that the researcher makes. Uh, to reject the null hypothesis and then to accept the null. Um, so we look here, a type 1 error is when you reject the, reject the null hypothesis and choose your own, um, but the null hypothesis is actually true, so the opposite is actually true. You're misrepresenting the data. Um, type 2 error accepts the null hypothesis, but the original hypothesis is actually correct. All right, so for example, when we look at this, uh, an example of this, your original hypothesis, a bomb threat was called into the office, uh, so we need to evacuate the school, All right? And so that is your, that would be the hypothesis. And so the null hypothesis is there's no bomb threat in the school, so we do not need to evacuate. All right, so that's the opposite there. All right, so um, in the truth about the population, a type 1 error would be, right, where the null hypothesis is true, but you reject it. So the students evacuated, uh, yet the bomb squad does not find a bomb and erred on the side of caution. Um, the type 2 error is going to be the bomb threat is ignored and students stay in class, um, but the bomb goes off and students are injured, right? So your original hypothesis is true. There is a bomb, and we should evacuate, but they still, but they kind of go with the null, the opposite with the null hypothesis, and say, right, we're not going to evacuate because we don't believe it. Okay. So you have a couple of correct decisions. Students evacuate, um, evacuated. The bomb squad finds the bomb and safely remove it, and everybody is safe. And then. Uh, the other is no evacuation, right? You're kind of rolling the dice here. No evacuation, no bomb threat. No bomb threat's going to be ignored. Students stay in class and everybody is safe. So you're kind of rolling the dice there, kind of hoping that uh, nothing happens. All right. With inferential statistics, the one thing that you're going to want to pay really close attention to is statistical significance. Um, and that's the difference between, uh, the difference observed between two sample groups. It is probably not due to chance. And the difference instead is likely due to a real difference uh, between the samples. And so the way that we find statistical significance is uh, the data is significant when the likelihood of a difference being due to chance is less than 5 out of 100. So 90, in other words, there is 95% chance or greater likelihood that any difference is seen is due to the, your independent variable. All right. So numerically, it would be P is less than or greater than 0 0.05, right? So your P value is less than 0 0.05. Um, that's important because if research is statistically significant, it means that the results are probably not a fluke or due to chance. Right? So they are on purpose, right? So um, study this, and we will uh, meet in class and discuss this a little bit further. Have a good night.